Our scripture comes from Acts 4, verses 31 to 37. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite from Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. The kingdom of God will not be a capitalist movement. That sometimes that's hard for uh, uh, the Western church to understand, so I'm going to say it again. The kingdom of God will not be a capitalist movement. Now, lest I be seen as anything other than an equal opportunity offender, the kingdom of God will also not be a socialist movement. We live in a world that thinks in terms of binaries, and as I like to remind other people and hate to be reminded myself, all binaries in the kingdom of God are false binaries. God doesn't think that if it's not capitalist, it must be socialist. That's how we think. Economics is simply a, a form of moving uh, uh, goods or services from places where they are plentiful to places where they are needed. And uh, capitalism is based essentially on the idea that uh, we can move those, those goods or services to places, and then we have a, um, a, a, a currency, something durable, uh, that allows us to store a value uh, longer than, say, um, uh, uh, the things that we might, uh, th that actually have value in our world, say food. Food is not a durable so uh, a resource. It doesn't last forever. Eventually, if you store up a ton of food in a barn and just keep it forever, eventually it's going to go bad and it loses its value. And so we develop a currency that says, I can sell you something and then I can hang on to that, this money, and this money, in theory, will forever be worth something, and then I can store it. I, don't, I can keep more than I need or keep more than I need for right now so that at some point later on I can, I can use that. And if you want a, a good example of the fact that that's not how the kingdom of God is going to work, uh, uh, looking at how God prepared the Israelites to move into the promised land as he's, as he's ridding them of, of uh, their expectations as they left the land of Egypt and gets them ready for how things are going to be uh, when they enter the promised land, he provides them with their daily bread, but tells them, if you take more than you need for today... It will just rot. Nothing will have value beyond what you need right now. You have to trust I will provide you with what you need right now. And that wasn't just coincidence because actually they were allowed to gather what they needed for two days on Fridays so that they didn't have to gather on the Sabbath. Miracle. But the kingdom of God will also not be a socialist movement, which is what some folks feel when we read scriptures like the one uh, that Debbie just read for us today, where nobody owned anything, they, they sold everything that they had, and they shared everything in common, and some folks start to feel a little bristly. Uh, preacher, are you trying to sell me on some socialist or communist movement here? No, because... There is nobody who is telling people that they have to give up everything they own. There is no uh, a power that says uh, the apostles have no authority, they have no military, they have no police force that says you have to do this. And there's a story just a, a little bit later where somebody uh, sells their land and, and claims to give everything but then holds a little back and uh, 
those, that couple dies instantly? Well, the apostles don't do that. And actually, I, I would suggest that that story um, uh, has a different, carries a different meaning. The eternal life that, they, that the folks are living into as they create this movement, if you don't give everything to it, then you lose that eternal life. It's not really about an instant death. It's about losing the life that, God is, that you're gaining in God, right? If you're, not, uh, if you're holding something back, then you're not really buying in. But we can, we can talk about that's not the scripture for today. We can talk about that at another time. So why are people giving everything to hold it all in common? If they don't have to, if they're not being told to, nobody can enforce it. Why is this movement that began as 12 followers of Jesus and then would sometimes expand and then contract and expand and contract, why is it right now sort of catching on in all of these people who are gathered from all these different lands suddenly deciding we want to pool everything we have and make sure that there are no needy among us. What is, can, what is the, the catalyst for this moment? Well, I don't know if you noticed, when, when Debbie began the scripture reading uh, this morning, she began with, when they had prayed. When they had prayed tells us that um, something had happened, a, a prayer had happened just before this. And uh, actually, just before this, John and, uh, and Peter had been arrested and were, were sort of uh, held uh, on trial in front of uh, the powers and principalities of the, of the area, and, uh, and they made their argument, and eventually they were released. And when they told the people, all the gathered people, what had happened, the people rose up with one voice and they prayed this prayer. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, everyone decided that they wanted to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So what did that prayer just say? In this space, in this town, this place where uh, the, the, the powers and principalities of the world hold sway, where we stand in the shadow of, of those who, who had so much power that they were able to stand up against Jesus, God's anointed one, kill, put him to death. And yet that did not end his story. Here in their shadow, in the shadow of the power of the world, they make threats and still God reaches out God's hand to heal and to do signs and wonders. They recognize that the powers of the world had done everything they could against them and nothing prevailed. It broke open and suddenly the folks saw that something else was possible. And all of those things that they had stored up to, to, to try to give themselves some little piece of power, some little buy-in to this world, you know, some little safety net in this world of uh, 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 land that they owned or, or some savings or something, something that might protect them against the powers and principalities of this world, none of it seemed important. And all of a sudden, the only thing that seemed important was saying, who among us needs something? Let's, let's take care of, just as God is taking care of us, let us take care of each other.
Do y'all know, if I say Rob Bell, is that a name that rings a bell? Uh, no pun intended, sorry, I don't mean, I didn't mean to do that, yeah. Some of you, yes, some of you are nodding your heads, yeah. I saw, hit some hands, yeah. Uh, Rob Bell was a, a church planter, and now he's a, uh, he, well, he was a church planter, and then he was an author, and now he speaks whenever he wants to, has a podcast, and mostly, like, surfs for a living. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a hard life, but somebody's got to do it, and uh, uh, Rob Bell and I go way back, and uh, we've got kind of a love-hate relationship. He doesn't know that. He's never, he doesn't know who I am. He's, I've never met him, but, uh, but I feel like I know him well, and he and I have a love-hate relationship. Uh, a lot of his work has been really inspiring to me, um, and I really appreciated it, uh, especially his stuff about church planting, until I became a church planter. And then his story about how he, like, he went into a community, and he, like, he's like, you know, just me and a couple friends, we decided, we felt called to, to, to plant a church, and so we rented a, a, um, an old abandoned uh, 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 department store that, used to be, that was connected to an old mall. You and some of your friends? Uh, well, okay, that's cool. And we decided, well, we're not going to put up any signage or advertise, because that's just not, we're not about that. If people want to come, they're going to come. And if nobody shows up, that's okay. We're just going to do what we feel called to do. And the first day I showed up, I, like, I hid in a closet, and, finally, and I kept thinking nobody's going to show up. And I, I came out on stage, uh, on stage to preach, and there were, there were 300 people there. And the next week there were 600 people there. And as I was trying to scrounge up 12 folks to show up to my first worship service as a church planter, I thought... You're a liar. No, I didn't think that. I thought, I'm sure there's truth here that goes beyond the facts of the story, okay? That's what I thought. I thought, uh, truth, there, the, the truth doesn't always have to be factual. And I thought, this is certainly not as factual as I thought it was before I started church planting. But Rob uh, has, has frequently said recently, and again, he's no longer pastoring. Um, he still speaks... Uh, and teaches about spiritual things, but he's frequently said, were he to start a church today, uh, they wouldn't, he wouldn't preach. He wouldn't do a big, uh, a big to-do. What he would do is they, their service would, would involve, um, they'd get together, maybe they would do some music, because who doesn't like music? They would take communion together, and then they would all gather around the communion table and put their bills on the table and say, nobody leaves until all of these are figured out. In other words, now that he has all the money he needs and he doesn't need to, to make a living off of planting a church, and God bless him, that's, this, is, this is what the ideal is, right? We don't serve God and mammon. Now that he can just serve God, he says, we would gather together to remember God's grace for us, and then we would act as though we believed it enough to say, None of us leaves until we figure out how, this, how we transform this world, at least for those around the table. And I'd like to think that then they would start asking themselves, who's not at the table yet? How do we offer this grace more widely? And, and then how do we offer, uh, how do we take care of the bills of, of folks more widely? How do we free people from the powers and principles, the things that bind them in this earth, so we can free them to experience God's grace in a way that isn't just something for the life uh, beyond, but something that transforms their lives here and now. There's another book, not written by Rob Bell, called Liturgies of the Ancient Church. Riveting read. Do you want to borrow it? It's in my office. Uh, nobody's ever taken me up on this. It's actually, it's actually a really uh, 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 dry uh, text. Yeah, strange. Um, but it documents some of the earliest, uh, 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 some of the earliest, um, or, it, or it has, it shows some of the earliest documentation we have of what worship looked like in the ancient church. And one of the, the things that we, um, we, we almost never hear about, but it's, it's in two of the earliest documents that we get from the ancient church, is that when, when the ancient church gathered together to do 
uh, to uh, recognize the sacraments, there were three cups involved. Uh, in addition to the, the wine, uh, which, was, which accompanied the bread, there was also water, as a cup of water, to represent baptism. There's a third cup that doesn't show up anywhere else. We don't get this anywhere past the, like, second century, I think, is when, uh, uh, when this, this text uh, is cited. It's called the loving cup, or the cup of milk and honey. And um, it literally was filled with honeyed milk. And it was, a, uh, it was to represent the, the promise of God when the Israelites were given the, the, the Holy Land, right? This is, will be a land of milk and honey. Now, does that mean that everybody had milk and honey? No, that wasn't the point. Milk and honey was to represent you will have everything you need, right? And it was designed differently. Uh, Summer had this commission for me when I was, uh, when I was ordained. And you can see... It's got three handles, because this wasn't served just by the bishop, unlike the, the other elements. Um, this was made so that you could take it and drink from it, and then pass it to the next person in the community. And they could take that handle, and then they would take it and drink from it and pass it to the next person. Because the abundance of God was recognized in the early church, as being something to, uh, that needed to both be shared and that really came to fruition in the community. We served each other in that way. And that's why on this morning when we are doing our uh, Commitment Sunday, when we're inviting uh, folks to turn in their uh, participation cards. Now, for those of you uh, uh, who may be with us for the first time or, or maybe you've been a regular with us but you're just not sure if this is your faith community yet? This is your spiritual home? Don't worry about this. This is a, 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 give me a moment, I apologize, but a moment for a little bit of inside baseball here. But uh, uh, for those of us who, uh, for whom this is our spiritual home, a church is never intended to be uh, an organization that provides a service for those who join, right? A church is Nothing more or less than what the people who are members of a church contribute to it and make it. This is what we do together. And so as we uh, uh, turn in our commitment cards, these are about what we feel called to give, both in terms of um, work and uh, money for the coming year, so that we can make plans of, based on what we feel God is calling us to do and what we feel like the community is feeling called to offer, we can start to make plans for what that coming year might look like. And we, I've placed the loving cup here as a reminder. We're not going to pass the one cup around because um, uh, I just haven't figured out a way to do that yet. That doesn't feel like, a, it's not our practice. It's good to remember, but it's not something uh, that I know how to do yet. But it is a good reminder as we come and we leave our cards, our commitment uh, on the table, that this is our offering to God, even as it is uh, around a table where we receive the offering that God has first promised us.